Hello, welcome to Understanding the Old Testament. My name is Brennan Breed. I teach at Columbia Theological Seminary, and I'm happy to be your guide over the next few weeks to the Old Testament. So this session, we're going to talk a little bit about the background of the history and the culture of the ancient Near East, and I'll give you a little bit of uh, my personal way of relating to the Bible and understanding the Bible. Um, the idea here is just to give you a little w window into me and, and what's important to me as a reader. Um, you don't have to agree with me uh, by any means, uh, and you very well might not agree with me in, on some points, um, but this is just to get, help you understand where I'm coming from, but also to lay a foundation so that we can have a dialogue together uh, as a class over the next few weeks. So when you think of the Bible, or if you tell someone, hey, think of the Bible, uh, they'll probably think about something like this, you know, gold lettering around the outside, binding the name Holy Bible on it. There's a table of contents on the first page. Um, but this is not what anyone in the ancient world would have thought of when you said the word Bible. Uh, believe it or not, this uh, actually is what you're looking at right here. This is a technology a technology that was invented at a very particular point in time in the history of the world. Um, so this is a, a codex. Uh, the, all of these things around me are code codices or codexes. Um, this is a codex. and uh, This right here, this book here is a, a codex. A codex is anything that has uh, pages that are bound together with a spine. And this is a very specific form of technology, a technology of reading and writing, uh, that was created uh, in the Roman period. Well, it was created before the Roman period, but basically became a big deal, uh, became important in the Roman period, and it really became important uh, with uh, the, the growth of Christianity in the Roman Empire. This is a thing that happened really after the time of Jesus. Even though people had invented this type of thing, like a pieces of paper bound together uh, and, or parchment bound together um, with a spine. They had invented that uh, quite some time before, but it wasn't in common usage. Um, so how did people actually relate to writing? How did people write things down before that? Well, uh, in the ancient world, the very ancient world, the dawn of writing in ancient Sumer around the year 3000 BC or so, uh, they, people would write on pieces of clay uh, with reeds, like actual like things that grew in the ground. They'd just kind of break them off and start to kind of write um, on these mud tablets. Uh, and they would get baked every once in a while, and they would turn into kind of clay. Uh, and then uh, they would you know, turn into kind of hard-baked clay. Uh, and then they would stick around for a long time. We still have some of these, these cuneiform tablets in the ancient world. Uh, but then uh, in Egypt, people started to invent something called papyrus. Um, so the, again, this is, this is not how the Bible existed in the ancient world. Um, papyrus is uh, something that's made with, uh, I mean, it's what, where we get our word paper from, uh, but it's these little fibers that come from something, that, papyrus, the papyrus plant, a very particular kind of plant. Um, and you can make this kind of paper-like stuff out of it, but it was actually very, very expensive in the ancient world. Uh, and there are certain times where it was difficult to get in Israel because the papyrus plant did not grow very well in Israel. Uh, there's one little area where, where it grew from time to time. Um, but overall, they would have to import this stuff from Egypt to write on it. Uh, other things you could write on were like disposable pieces of broken pottery and things like that. They call, they're called ostraca, these little broken pot shards. You'd write, people would write little messages on and things like this. But if you wanted to write something down uh, that would be passed down for a long period of time, you'd write it on a papyrus scroll. And these scrolls could only get so big. Uh, and after uh, a long period of time, um, there was the invention of parchment scrolls, or scrolls that are on, on like basically leather. Um, that's the, this one right here. This is the Great Isaiah Scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls are mostly on parchment, um, so that, that's this kind of leather-like material. Uh, but there's only a, cer a certain amount of stuff you can write before you're stitching together these pieces of leather, uh, and it gets too, too big to carry or too heavy to carry, and you certainly couldn't fit all of the texts of a Bible like uh, even just the Old Testament, you couldn't fit all that stuff into one big scroll. Um, you could hardly fit all of the book of Isaiah into one scroll. Uh, so that is to say, in the ancient world, when people wrote the Bible down, or had the text that became the Bible, uh, they wrote them on these long scrolls, and they stuffed them into scroll jars, and you'd have to have tons and tons of scroll jars to have all of the books that later became the Bible uh, collected in one place. So this is a little image from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the... Uh, the, the oldest biblical texts that we have in existence. Um, these are some actual pictures right above me um, of some kind of decayed scrolls that were found in one of the caves there in a place that's now called Qumran. Uh, we actually don't know the name of the ancient place, uh, what they what they called it themselves. Uh, they were just the community. But in any event, this over here, you can see on the other side, those kind of jars. These were the kinds of things that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in. They were hidden in these caves uh, around where the community is, just off the, the coast of the Dead Sea. 
And the reason that they were hidden there was probably because the Romans were coming to, to invade and, and burn down everything, and the people in the community wanted to save their biblical texts. Uh, these were written uh, sometime just before the time of Jesus. So in the century or two before Jesus is when most of the Dead Sea Scrolls were written down. Some of them were written down after the time of Jesus. But these scrolls, you can see these, these kind of jar, giant jars, and you have like scrolls in them. Um, this is not a, a Bible. It's not, it's not like this, at least, right? Uh, but even the word Bible is this plural word, right? Bible means the books. <laughs> it means like the many books. There's lots of books that are in this collection. So this is uh, all of just kind of an introduction to say um, that when we sit down to read the Bible today, we tend to think of it in this uh, form that's been made for us. Right, it's been edited for us. That's in a language that we know, English. Um, it's in a format that's comfortable to us, the codex form. Uh, but one of the things we're going to do in this class is we're going to try to step back in history a little bit, and we're going to try to uh, think about what these texts might have done and how they might have meant differently to folks in the ancient world. Uh, they had different cultural assumptions and different ways of writing and reading, different ways of singing, different ways of worshiping, and we're going to learn about some of that stuff to try to give us more depth. Uh, and more insight into some of these texts that seem so strange at first. If you've ever had a problem reading the prophets and saying, gosh, I have no idea what they're saying. Well, it's because they were written thousands and thousands of years ago <laughs> in a different language, in a different culture, using different kind of patterns of speech, uh, different cultural assumptions. And if we want to hear better, if we want to read in ways that probably produce more interesting readings and more uh, uh, impactful readings for us and for our communities, um, then it helps us to have some of this background information. Uh, and yours, by the way, is just how to write codex, and this is one of the very early codexes uh, or codices uh, that you could you could have seen. So this this is what we're going to end up kind of coming back to. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be reading the Bible in English, um, uh, but what I hope to do is uh, help us to see this thing uh, really as like a strange and foreign object uh, that we then kind of come back into contact with. Uh, so one of the um, helpful ways, at least helpful for me, about thinking about how we ask questions about the Bible um, is uh, this, there, there's a really interesting, I think to me, um, kind of symbol or metaphor uh, for any text. It doesn't have to be the Bible. Um, but that is thinking about a book as three things at the same time. Uh, thinking about it as, first of all, a window that when I open up a Bible or any book, really, um, I, can, I can ask questions about that world that's kind of behind the text, almost like I'm looking through this book into a world or a time that's kind of behind the book, right? So what was happening when this book was written? What was the history that led up to it being written? Who wrote it? Um, why did they write it? What did they mean? Um, what sorts of things were, were, there were problems they were trying to address with it? What was the reception by the earliest readers? How did the earliest readers understand this? Um, did they hate it? Did they love it? Uh, so here's a little picture of a window. So thinking about the text as a window to the ancient world. Um, this is a book written by ancient Israelites. Uh, this is a book written by ancient Israelites over the span of many thousands of years. Uh, they were in very different situations. They were doing different things and assuming different things. They changed over time. Their language changed over time. Their religious beliefs changed over time. We can see this through these texts, as we'd imagine that any people would change over, I mean, how much have Americans changed over the last just 300 years that we've been a country? Well, lots, right? Well, just imagine over the course of thousands of years how much Israel changed, right? So all to say uh, that these uh, ancient texts, we can ask these questions. And if you ask, think about yourself asking these questions like, who wrote this? When did they write this? Why did they write this? Um, what sorts of questions were they addressing in their own day? Um, what was their intent? What was the intent of the first writer? Or how did the first readers understand or hearers understand this thing? Um, what was their response to it? Um, what sort of uh, like references were being made to different places? Like what was Nineveh like back then? Or what was uh, the weather like back then? Or what, what kind of uh, farming tools were they referring to here, right? Those questions about kind of that world of the past. Um, that's thinking about the text like a window. And when I talk about the world behind the text, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, the, that, that, those historical questions. And we'll, we'll deal with those mostly today, uh, but we'll always have those questions in view. There's another type of question we can ask when we read any piece of literature, but also the Bible. Um, and that's, we can think of it, instead of a window to the past, we can think about it like a painting. 
So if you look at a painting, this right here is Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh. Um, if you look at Starry Night and all you ask yourself is like about Van Gogh's autobiography and like, you know, or, or his biography, you know, like what, what did he eat for breakfast the morning he painted this and uh, what was his relationship to his brother and did he really cut his ear off and was he crazy and why was he crazy and did he drink all sorts of absinthe and liquors that made him go crazy and see things with tinted yellow eyes and that's why he sees the world and paints the world yellowish. Um, there's all sorts of interesting perhaps questions we can ask um, about Vincent Van Gogh himself and his mental health and his path from being an itinerant preacher, uh, which he was, um, to being a painter, to being a mental hospital patient, and then uh, and then ending his own life, right? There's all sorts of questions we can ask about that. But we can also say that those questions, to, that there are certain points at which those questions um, can get in the way of us appreciating and asking and kind of asking about his work right sometimes people's biographies can kind of get in the way of like what they've done uh that is to say like uh uh, if you all if you listen to the Beatles or something and all you ask about is like what was what was John like what was Paul like but you're not listening to the, to the music and asking questions about the music they made then you're kind of missing the point of what they were doing right so in any event um, what we might say of this world in the text when I when I open up the Bible and I say okay uh, who wrote this I'm asking about the world behind the text if I open it up and I say what did they write let's ask about like if I'm reading a poem right like the Psalms are poems. And if I'm reading this poem and I'm asking myself, how is this poem written? Uh, what, what are these words doing? How do they work as a work of art? You know, how do I appreciate the poem as a poem? Or the story, right? If I'm reading the story uh, of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis, right? The sacrifice of Isaac. And I read it and I'm, all I'm asking about is the history of child sacrifice or something like this. I, I'm missing, really, I think a, a big part of the point, which is that this is a, a a beautifully and terribly written story. Terribly in the sense that it's like, it's traumatizing to read this story about a man being asked to sacrifice his child, but it's written in such a compelling way, especially if you read it in Hebrew. Um, it's told in such a, uh, a terrifying way, but also this really impactful way. So all to say that asking questions about how this thing is written or what, uh, what, what does this thing do when you read it? Um, that's a second set of questions. Uh, I'll call those world in the text questions or maybe world of the text questions. Um, and so instead of asking uh, like in the, uh, Jesus' parables, right? If instead of asking, hey, the, par the parable of the prodigal son, did that really happen? Um, did, was there really a boy that Jesus knew that went off? And, you know, in, in a way, like that's not the point of the story, right? Jesus is telling the story so you think about your life. Um, the, Jesus wants you to care about the world in the text of the, of the prodigal son story instead of like caring about the historical details that might lie behind that story. Um, so all to say that uh, this is just another kind of world of questions that we can ask about the Bible. And then there's a third world that I think we can ask, a third world of questions or a third lens that we can use uh, to study the Bible. And that third lens is what we might call the world in front of the text. So again, if I imagine, if I open the text and ask, okay, who wrote this? When did they write this? What do they mean? I'm asking about that world behind the text. If I write, if I, if I ask questions about um, uh, how does this thing work as a work of art or how does it, how does it function, um, then I'm really asking questions about the world in the text. And if I ask the question, what does this mean for me? How does it reflect like a mirror my life? Um, what, are, what about the, the, the questions and the concerns that I bring to this text? How does it in a way reflect something back to me or shine something back to me? Um, how does that lead me to ask questions about myself or the people around me, um, what I'm doing, right? All those questions about like, how should I live? Um, what's right? What does God want me to do? You know, all those questions we can think about in terms of the Bible, but those are really world in front of the text questions, world, the, the kind of the mirror, um, uh, the word when we look at the text and we see a mirror. And none of those are the only way to read, right? Uh, you can use this as a way to think about reading really anything. Uh, you know, you can read the newspaper and think about, okay, who wrote the, this, this article? Why did this person write this article? This, is there something in the biography of this investigative journalist that's interesting or important? But you can also just kind of look at the way the story was written, the whatever whatever story you're reading in the, in the newspaper. But then you can also ask, okay, what does this mean for me? Like, how do I use this in my life? Or what does this ask me? To, does this kind of convince me to do something or to vote a certain way or to like uh, advocate for something or to give up on something, right? All to say that uh, those world behind the text, world in the text, and world in front of the text are questions, really sets of questions that we can bring to bear on these kinds of texts. And to me, it helps me organize my thoughts and organize my questions um, to help me uh, be more, in a way, 
reflective about what I'm doing when I'm studying the Bible. So I hope that's helpful. Um, then let me also say, uh, this is kind of a conviction that I have, and I'm just going to lay it out there. You don't have to agree with me. At least you don't have to agree, agree with the, the way I'm, I'm saying this uh, by any means. Um, but uh, this is just so you know how I assume the Bible works. Uh, for a lot of people, a lot of Christians, we'll talk about the Bible as the Word of God. Um, for a lot of Christians, this means that kind of God spoke it and it fell out of the sky, kind of shrink-wrapped, right? And like it came from God. Um, the way I understand it is that uh, the, the Bible is a way of God speaking to people, but also it was written by people. People were involved in the production of the Bible. Um, it's people's stories. It's people's songs. It's people's wisdom. Uh, their proverbs that they've passed down. Um, it's all sorts of things that comprise human culture. And I think that God works through human culture. This is this is my conviction. Uh, it's kind of an incarnational conviction. Um, this right here is a painting from Hu Qi, a Chinese Christian artist. And this is the Annunciation. This is the way he sees the Annunciation. It's based on like the, the imagery is kind of a combination of uh, European style imagery of the Annunciation, like you might see an Italian Renaissance painting, but it's also uh, heavily influenced by Hukki's own Chinese context. Um, so the way I see it uh, is a bit like this, uh, right? That you can't just, um, th there, there's no uh, expression of who God is that a human can understand that's not in human language. In other words, every, God's going to speak to people. It's going to be in a language that they can understand. It's going to be in symbols they can understand metaphors they can understand, right? I mean, saying that Jesus is the Lamb of God makes sense to people who have seen lambs and who've uh, shepherded them um, and who see them and have, e have eaten them, right? Have raised them, have cared for them, have saved them, right? Th that's why that makes sense. Um, Lamb of God doesn't make a whole lot of sense to people who've never seen lambs, who don't know what they are, to an alien life form that has not, <laughs> no idea what a lamb is, right? Uh, God communicates to people in ways that make sense to them. Uh, and that not all humans have the same language and not all humans have the same kind of shared cultural expectations. In fact, we have really different languages and shared cultural expectations and uh, reference points, right? And metaphors that we use uh, in our culture. Uh, people who translate the Bible into different languages have to get really creative sometimes and they have to really understand the other culture into which they're trying to translate the Bible into. The reason they have to do this is because people only understand in their culture and in their language and through their culture and language. There's no human understanding outside of language. And God is big. Whatever God is, God is enormous and impossible to put into words. If God created the entire universe, then there's no way that I can just kind of put God into my brain and understand God, right? God's bigger than my brain. Uh, there's no way I'm going to fully comprehend God. If that's true and that God's trying to kind of put a communication about God, well, who God is, what God's all about, into a form that humans can understand. And even as a Christian, I believe, into the person of Jesus Christ, that is that God communicates through humanity. Uh, that also means that God communicates through human writing and human culture, which has its problems, right? God is kind of saying, okay, fine, I'll communicate through this stuff, <laughs> right? That's all we got. Uh, and that means that the Bible's got all sorts of human stuff in it, human culture in it, all around it. Uh, and what that means is that we have to both kind of, in a way, under, try to understand different human cultures, ancient human cultures, if we're going to get the most out of the Bible, I think, that we possibly can. But also we need to expect that when we look in the Bible, we're going to find human stuff. We're going to find all the problems that we find all throughout humanity in the Bible and through the Bible. And in a way, um, God kind of says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work through this, right? I'm got, uh, part of redemption is to use what humans can do. Uh, so in any event, that to me, this idea that uh, God is working through uh, humanity and through human stuff um, is essential to us understanding how the Bible works, I think. Uh, so in any event, th today I'm going to give a little bit of a background to uh, the world behind the text. Um, this if you look at the Bible, it's kind of a window to the past. And if we're looking at the Bible as a window to the past, then that world, what we to today, like scholars, would would call that world is the world of the ancient Near East. Uh, ancient, meaning it's in the deep past, right? Um, but really, we're talking about um, the area between Mesopotamia, which you can see in this map here. That's the area uh, that's to the east of Israel. Israel's right above Egypt. So here's Egypt right here, right? And then Israel is north and a little bit to the east. You might be able to see Jerusalem on that map. And then you keep going to the east and you see Mesopotamia. And uh, a lot of folks have called this area the Fertile Crescent. Um, 
which uh, really is talking about those rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that start in the Persian Gulf and go up uh, through um, what is today Iraq, uh, up into Syria and up even into Turkey, uh, and then kind of bending down the sea, co sea coast of the Mediterranean Sea, the, the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, all the way to Egypt and the Nile Valley. Uh, and that's the area that kind of shares an ancient culture uh, that is, it's not uniform, there's all different kinds of, but in, in a way it's kind of like today's uh, world shares some cultural touchstones, like the Marvel movies are everywhere in the world. Uh, every country in the world has some kind of access to seeing uh, the the Thor movies, right? I mean, it just it, it, they're blockbusters. They they're all over the the world, right? And and not all cultures are the same by any means, but they have this ability to kind of understand in a way some of these um, cultural touchstones. And in this ancient Near Eastern world, there were these kind of broad, broadly shared cultural reservoirs. We might say this kind of like broadly shared culture where. Israel is not the same as Egypt, and they're not the same as Babylon, one of the Mesopotamian peoples. Um, they're not the same as the Hittites, who lived in what is today Turkey, uh, not there in Anatolia. They're not the same as the Canaanites, exactly, but and they're not the same as the Phoenicians, exactly, but they all get the same stuff. That is to say, everyone in this world shares some very clear similarities of culture. So if you hear and read uh, the ancient songs, the religious songs of the Egyptians and the ancient religious songs of the Mesopotamians, guess what? They sound almost exactly like the Psalms, except the Psalms are directed to Yahweh, and there are some specific differences. Um, the Israelites aren't just copying stuff from everyone around them, but they are writing songs that sound like ancient or Eastern songs. Just like if you go to a contemporary church today, you're going to hear some songs that make sense as kind of either like early modern European songs if you're doing organ music or as contemporary music, right? I mean, people are making music that makes sense to them. Uh, that's how ancient people did it too. That's how ancient Israelites did it. Uh, ancient Israel comes from the peoples around them. Uh, Abram comes from Mesopotamia. A lot of people come from Egypt, we're told, in the book of Exodus. There was a mixed multitude, Exodus 12 says, that left Egypt. Some Egyptians, some Semitic folks that were from Canaan and Syria that had ended up down in Egypt that fled with the with the Israelites. When they come into Canaan, Canaanites join them. Joshua, uh, uh, I mean Caleb is uh, is kind of famously not an Israelite. Um, Caleb is someone who joins these people, um, and there's plenty of other folks. The the whole kind of tribes of people uh, end up kind of assimilating into Israel and, and joining Israel. Uh, all this, and they're, they're Canaanites, they're Syrians, they're Mesopotamians, they're Egyptians, they're Amorites, they're whatever. All these folks come into this group of Israel because in a way they can communicate with Israel, they can understand Israel a bit. Uh, and that's because Israel is this amalgam, this kind of melting pot of lots of people from this area of the world. And so the things that they say make sense to the folks around them, at least in part. And the parts that they say that are kind of strange, we'll get to. So Israel does have things to say that are not just like the peoples around them. But in order for us to get a real kind of um, leverage on understanding what it is that they say that's unique, then we have to understand what everyone else around them is saying. So uh, one other thing to say is that um, Israel is a latecomer on the scene. So by the time Israel emerges as a people, sometime around the year 1200 BC, the first mention we have of Israel as a people is the Merneptah Stella of Pharaoh Merneptah right around the year 1200 BC. Before that, we don't have mention of Israel, and it seems that there wasn't something called Israel before that. Uh, but uh, when Israel emerges around the year 1200 BC, that's a long, long time ago. But 1200 BC was actually kind of late in terms of the history of the ancient Near East. Writing is invented sometime around the year 3300 BC in Mesopotamia, and they'd already had cities there for quite some time. Cities even in what today is the kind of state of Israel, some of those cities were very ancient. So um, uh, some of the cities along the seaboard, some of the Phoenician cities were were cities from like 6,000 BC. Uh, Jericho in the West Bank was from, I mean, my goodness, when, when was that founded? Sometime around the year 6,000 BC as well, I think, or 5,000 BC. Um, so that is to say that uh, Israel emerges as a people around the year 1200 BC. The pyramids of Giza have been built for 
2,000 years, and Egypt is so old it's not even building pyramids anymore when Israel emerges as a people. Um, uh, this is another example. This is a, a little artist's reconstruction of Nippur. It's in what's today Iraq, but in the ancient world it would have been part of Babylon. Mesopotamia is just an, a name for that kind of general region. It's actually a Greek name for that for that entire region. But it's in the area that we would, we would call Babylon. Um, and this is the city to which uh, some Israelites... Uh, Judahites, people from Judah, were taken during the exile. So when the temple that Solomon built uh, was destroyed uh, and people were taken uh, in captivity to Babylon, they were resettled, um, some of them in the city of Babylon, but most of them in other areas. This is the city of Nippur, where uh, many Jews were resettled, and they were told to farm and build a life there, and they were not held like in you know, prisons or anything like that. They were told they were they were they became farmers, and then they became other kinds of professions too. And they lived there uh, for quite some time until they were sent home um, uh, some forty years later um, by King Cyrus of Persia. But all to say that this is the place to which Ezekiel was brought, and the book of Ezekiel was written in this city of Nippur, uh, is a little suburb actually called Al Yehudu or Judah Town, uh, and. When Ezekiel saw this, right, because Ezekiel was brought to this town and told to settle near here um, and farm here and hang out here. Um, and when he saw this, uh, Israel and Judah, like the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah together kind of forming Israel, the people. Um, uh, Judah had only been a people for less than 500 years, really. Um, so David is around the year 1000 BC. And... Uh, Judah had been a kingdom for somewhere less than 500 years. When Ezekiel saw this ancient city, if you think of the moment that his eyes laid, he laid eyes on it, you and I right now are closer in time to Ezekiel looking at Nippur than he was to the founding of the city at the moment that he was looking at it. That is to say, Nippur was founded sometime around the year 4000 B.C., and Ezekiel was looking at it in the year 587 BC. This city was already some 3,000 years old when Ezekiel was looking at it. And you and I are about 2,500 years from Ezekiel. So Ezekiel was closer to us than he was to the founding of the city where he was brought. And his people had only been a people for 500 years. And Mesopotamia had had, the city he was being brought to was already over 3,000 years old. So just imagine that, coming to a city and it's 3,000 years old, and your people are only 500 years old, right? That that kind of gap there, I mean, and so when, this is all to say that when Israel emerges as a people, the culture of the ancient Near East is already thick and rich and deep and full of treasures, Think of stories like Gilgamesh that were famous all over the world and that they had copies of, uh, even in uh, the area that became Israel. Um, that is to say, people knew the story everywhere. They had uh, rich religious traditions. They had rich musical traditions. Um, they had uh, kind of you know, liturgy manuals and things like this. Um, and we'll get into some of this. But all to say uh, that that Israel is these people, right? Abram and Sarah come from this area and bring all of their kind of culture with them uh, to start Israel. So one of the things that's going to help us in this class is to say uh, when we look at a text from the Bible, we're going to ask the question, what kind of literature is this? What kind of thing am I reading? And the, the point is that uh, nobody writes something without a genre. A genre means like a classification of, a, of literature. Like In other words, if I write something and I start once upon a time, you know what I'm writing. You know, you know, kind of what I'm saying, right? Once upon a time, it's a fairy tale, right? Once upon a time. So if I say once upon a time there was a girl and she her hair grew really, really long and she was stuck at the top of a castle, right? And you ask, how long was the hair? How many feet? <laughs> right? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I, it, it was really long, right? It went all the way to the ground. How is it possible for this girl's hair to grow all the way to the ground? And what I would say is, did you miss the beginning of the story? Once upon a time, right? The point of the story is not how long the girl's hair was or whatever. Um, the genre of that is a fairy tale. And a fairy tale brings with it some expectations, some expectations about what kind of story, is, what kind of questions are good questions to ask about this story, or what kind of point am I trying to make it? Why would I say this? But it also brings up kind of a setting, right? 
once upon a time, right? It makes the storyteller kind of like in the position of like a teacher or a parent or whatever, and the, the people listening kind of are in the position of kids, even if they're not kids, right? Once upon a time, you kind of go back into this, kind of imagine a setting of like a cozy storytelling space, right? That, that that's that's a genre and it brings with it again this kind of world with it and these this world of questions and a world of like concerns right and then things that just don't work with that genre um here's another genre uh or uh, let me say this is another clue to a genre that's a modern one dear sir or madam right if you get a letter and it says dear sir or madam then you know something very specific and that's that they don't know who you are <laughs> and that's tells us what kind of genre it would be, what, 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 what kind of category I would put this letter into, and that's the category of form letter, right? A form letter, like they're, they're sending it to any, everyone and anyone and they don't even know. So what do I do with form letters? I throw them in the trash, right? That's the kind of implied setting for a form letter for me is the recycling bin. Does that make sense? So all to say that the, uh, when we can talk about genres all day long, you know, um, uh, we can we can mention these things, right? So like the horror genre or the fantasy genre um, or the history genre or the newspaper story genre, like the you know, kind of reporting. Um, and you know, if if I am reading a newspaper and I start asking all kinds of questions about the poetry that I'm reading, and someone's like, "Those aren't those aren't poems. Those are just really quickly written stories that come out every single day." There's a new one, and the reporter is trying to write as fast as they possibly can. These are not things to go to to look for like literary, you know, master masterfulness, right? I mean, like, uh, maybe you could find some like cool wordplay in uh, a, in a newspaper, but you're going to be more rewarded if you go look at a book of poetry if you're trying to find beauty in words, right? Because that's those are the people who think about beauty in words. So all to say that when we look at the Bible, even when we start in the first page of the Bible and we start out with a story about the creation of the world. We're going to start asking, this is for next session, we're going to start asking the question, what kind of literature am I reading? And what kind of expectations do modern readers tend to bring when we start to read a story about the cosmos? Well, I start to think about science, and I start to think about history, and I start to think about um, kind of technology and, you know, sci-fi stuff or whatever. You know, I mean, I start to think about kind of uh, outer space and whatever. Uh, I, I might think about NASA. Um, I might think about my my earth science, my physics class, stuff like that, quarks and neutrinos and, and things like that, black holes. Uh, but the ancient writers of this, I might say, okay, let's, let me set aside all the stuff that I tend to bring up when I start to talk about outer space. And instead, let me think, what did ancient people's genre of creation story, in other words, does it sound like the creation stories of the peoples around them to some degree? And should I expect ancient Israelites to know about modern science? Uh, those are just questions that we'll, we'll, we'll bring up again uh, our, in our next time. But all to say that we're going to compare some of the literature from ancient Israel to the peoples around them so that we can get a better idea of what Israel's doing that's special or different, what's unique about them. Uh, so here's an, just one example, right? So you read the book of Amos. It's a prophetic book, and a lot of people try to read the prophets, and they're like, I don't get what they're doing, <laughs> right? The, this doesn't make any sense. We're going to do a whole session on prophets. Um, but Amos 6.1, Amos says, Woe to you who are at ease in Zion. Uh, woe, woe to you. And I might be like, I don't know what that means, right? Well, a woe oracle is a very specific kind of speech that you might say in the ancient world. And people heard this kind of thing. And what it means for you, what it means in a way is, I'm really sorry that you're going to die. Like, I feel bad that you're about to die. So the ones who are at ease in Zion, and Zion is like the a name for really the city of Jerusalem. It's one of the hills that Jerusalem's on, but it's the kind of uh, it becomes kind of the name for the entire place, right? This is the city of Jerusalem. Woe to you! Like I am really sorry that you're about to die. Those of you who are lounging in Jerusalem in the city. Like, whoa, okay. That puts it in a different context, right? So this is the kind of thing that we're going to do, and that's why I'm going to ask the question again and again, what kind of literature are we reading? And that's what I encourage you to do when you read uh, the Bible. Uh, so this is why we I talk about kind of this Isaiah, I mean, uh, Ezekiel kind of coming and setting eyes on the city of Nippur in Mesopotamia because he's shoved into uh, what is what is for him a slightly different cultural context as well, um, which in, in, impacts his writing. Um, so in any event, one other example that I want to give you is the sacrifice. Why is it that uh, ancient Israel has a whole book, Leviticus, about how to burn animals, right? Um, how, to, how to sacrifice, cut them up and burn them, right? This is like crazy, right? I mean, why, does God want us to like cook animals for God? 
Well, the answer is, well, if you ask anyone in the ancient world, they'll say, yes, the gods, right? Because everyone else around Israel is polytheistic. They believe there's lots of gods out there. They'll, they'll say, yes, the gods need food. The expectation in the ancient world is that the gods need to eat food. And where do they get the food from? They get the food from people. We'll talk about this more next time. Uh, but just trust me that this is this is the case. They believe, the ancient people believe that like the sacrifices that you bring feed the gods and keep the world going. Because if you don't feed the gods, the gods will die and then the world will go into chaos and the sun won't shine and you know, everyone will die. So your sacrifices keep the world going. Um, the animal sacrifices are put onto an altar. This is a little image of like a kind of modern you know, drawing about uh, trying to reconstruct uh, an ancient Israelite altar. But the point is, is that you can see there's like a grate and there's coals and you put the animal on top of the coals. This is what Leviticus tells us happens. I mean, what do you call that today when you got coals and a grill and you put the animal on top? That's called a barbecue. Why would you have the barbecue? Well, in the ancient world, you do it so that the gods can eat. But really, who eats the food? The priests go and eat the food, right? The point is that this is like, this is where the, this is how the priests survive, right? And so there's even a story uh, that's associated with the book of Daniel, where Daniel goes and like figures out that it's the priests of Baal eating these uh, sacrifices at the altar of Baal, and he kind of it's like a you know like a like a Agatha Christie mystery, you know, he like solves the mystery. Um, uh, but in any event, all to say that uh, this was you know kind of. Uh, something that people um, in Israel rejected. Uh, so if you read the book of Leviticus, it doesn't say God eats the sacrifices. God doesn't eat sacrifices. And we can say that everyone in ancient the ancient world, as far back as we can find, human culture sacrificed. I mean, you go to the cave paintings at Lascaux. There's a cave in France where there's paintings that are 40,000 years old. 40,000 years old. Right? I mean, this is like dawn of kind of human kind of culture, right? I mean, and that we can see. And you see this stuff and there's paintings and at the same time you also find evidence of kind of language, right? Uh, art, culture, but then also you'll find animal bones and altars and manipulated animal bones. That is to say that people gave thanks for the animals' lives that that they consumed in order for them to live, right? This was like something that they, and they gave thanks to the gods for it, right? But in ancient Israel, they do the same thing, but it means something slightly different. So in ancient Babylon, we have a ritual manual that we know of uh, where they sacrifice the animals and they take the blood of the animals and it scares away demons because they're kind of blaming the demons for the things they've done wrong. In ancient Israel, you take the body of the animal, you cook it, and the priests, the God doesn't eat it. They say, they say God doesn't eat this thing. God doesn't need to eat this food. Well, who eats the food? Well, the priests eat the food and they tell you that the priests eat the food, right? They're like, they're showing their cards, right? We, Priests need to eat. How do you think they're going to eat? That is that people have to bring their gifts and share them with the people who minister uh, on behalf of God. But also, the people who bring the food eat some of it. And then also, if you've wronged someone, uh, you bring them along and you eat with them. That is, you have a reconciliation meal. So the sacrifice gets turned into a reconciliation meal in ancient Israel. And on top of that, the blood doesn't get rid of demons in in uh, Leviticus, the blood, you put it on the horns of the altar and you wash away your sin. You got to put your hand on the goat and say, hey, I did something wrong. This is my bad. Uh, a demon didn't do it to me or for me. Right? I messed up. Can you take care of my sin? And here's a gift right, to help reconcile the wrong that I did. A real material uh, uh, kind of way to say I'm sorry. So in any event, I'll just say that like the the uh, some of the strangest stuff in the Old Testament, the stuff that just doesn't make sense at all, can really have this beautiful theology, but also like some stuff like that could help us today. I mean, what if you had reconciliation meals in your community today with people who had wronged each other, sitting down together with their families and with a mediator, the, the, the pastor, right? Sitting down with them and sharing a meal together, right? I mean, it, it could be amazing. Uh, but... Um, uh, if you just read Leviticus and don't know about this ancient world, it was everyone who read Leviticus in the ancient world knew all this stuff, but they didn't write it down because it was so normal to them. We, thank goodness, have tons of information about the ancient world where we can reconstruct some of this stuff uh, and get at some of these things that we've lost. And so it deepens and richens our engagement with the text. That's why, this is just one example of why I'm going to be going deep into some of the history of the ancient Near East uh, and the culture over the next few weeks. One thing else to say is uh, that when we read the Bible, the Bible is not a history book. Um, there's two different things. We could say there's history and there's the past, right? As we all know that history uh, are 
things that people write about the past, stories about the past, right? And, and uh, there can be many different histories written um, about, let's say, the Civil War in the United States, right? There can be lots of different ways that people write about this event, and there's lots of different ways that people can write about it that are correct. Whoever writes about this thing, well, there are all, there's also ways to write about it that are wrong, right? But uh, but there's lots of different ways to like write the story of it, right? That where you're accounting for the facts, um, and where people write from, the time they're writing, the point of view they're writing, the access, the particular documents they have access to, the particular sources they have access to, are all going to influence the way that they write, including their own biography, right? Their, their life story, their assumptions, their culture is going to come into the text, right? So uh, I live in Decatur, Georgia, right? An area uh, that's in the south of the United States. And um, uh, today it's a pretty progressive town. Um, if you lived here 100 years ago, it would have been very conservative. Uh, and if you were a white man in 19... 22, uh, and you were writing a history of the Civil War versus a white man living in Decatur, Georgia in 2022, um, you'd have very different perspectives on it, uh, I, would, I would assume at least, um, and different language to, to write about it, and, and different sources that you would consult to write your history. Um, and uh, my guess is that I today would prefer one over the other, right? Uh, but all to say that there's just, when we confront the Bible, um, People say, well, it's a, it's a book of history, right? Well, it's a book that's written by people. God was involved in the process, I think, but also I think God didn't like override all of the kind of humanity of the people who were involved in the writing process. God worked with their humanity. Um, so there's limitations to these people. They had limited sources. They had limited knowledge. They also saw and told stories. They saw things and understood things and told stories in ways that made sense to them as ancient people. And the ancient world, they didn't have history books like we have history books they didn't have like multiple source attestation and they didn't strive for objectivity in their storytelling and their history history telling um, they didn't try to get the past exactly as it was that wasn't an idea in the ancient world they didn't have video cameras and tape recorders when you read a speech from someone in the ancient world and the author is writing the person's speech down they didn't have a copy of the speech um, they were trying to reconstruct what that person would have said in the way that they would have said it. They're trying to capture the the spirit of that speech or like, well, you know, who this person is. Um, and those are the assumptions that are driving how ancient people write and how they pass down their stories. They also assume that the next generation is going to, in a way, rewrite the story a bit. This is just the way ancient um, stories are handed down and passed down. We'll talk about this more too, but um, this is just the kind of basic assumption of ancient people is that um, every generation, it's their job to try to re-understand the generations that came before them and then pass it down. Uh, and so they didn't have authors of books. Uh, there's no, um, the, the book of Isaiah doesn't say, I, Isaiah, wrote this. Um, in fact, the book of Jeremiah talks about Baruch, a scribe who's responsible for writing some of it, but there's also lots of parts that we don't know who wrote it. And that doesn't say I Baruch wrote every single word in this book, and um, there's this. Uh, we can also find places where people have like updated things, added things into certain books, um, and that's not bad. It's not wrong. Uh, today we have this idea that like an author signs a name to something, and it's like that's it. This is my my thing, uh, but that's not the way ancient people write or understand writing. Um, they understand that the scribes are not authors of texts uh, that have a copyright on them and things like this, but they see themselves as cooperating with and passing down a tradition and trying to update it so that people in their community can understand the, the new form of history, right? The new, like, how does this matter to us? What does it say to us today? And you can see that reflected in the way that people um, pass down the biblical text. And that's why it's important for us to think about all these people who came before us and the ways that they handled these texts, but also to think about how does this impact us? Uh, so in any event, uh, I just have this slide to say the world behind the text, right? Uh, to ancient people reading the Bible, this was a totally normal image. This right here is, uh, this is, this is a Neo-Assyrian image. This is from uh, Mesopotamia. Uh, and it's a body of a lion and wings of like a bird or like an eagle and a human head. And it's got horns. Uh, you get these, these little like lines kind of going like above its ears, like these lines kind of moving up. Uh, those are horns. And so this is, to, it's a divine creature and it's a human animal hybrid. And this was what sphinxes were. Right, the Sphinx in Giza is one of these human-animal hybrids, and this is what uh, cherubs were. This is basically a cherubim. Uh, cherubim weren't fat little babies. That was an invention of the like 
early, Middle Ages and the Renaissance in Italy. Those are Putti. Those are actually Roman gods, little Roman gods, little the pudgy babies that people think are angels. Um, th these are these are what what's, what cherubim are. Um, how do we know that? Because uh, this is they're called cherubim. Um, these are these are uh, and Karuv, uh in uh, other. Uh, nearby cultures, like so, this is this is these are cherubim, um, and they're these. We can read about them in Ezekiel, right? These kind of like animal human hybrid things in Ezekiel one, that crazy vision of the wheels within wheels. Um, but all to say that this is uh, this this would have been a totally normal picture for people who are reading uh, Genesis one uh, in their uh, kind of in the ancient context. So all to say that for us, we got to kind of get to the point where this is not total totally weird to us, <laughs> uh, but at first it is. We have to just be okay with that. Like this is going to be a little bit weird. Uh, so I got a couple more things, just basic ideas. Uh, and the first is that Israel um, is never very powerful. Uh, they don't have crazy resources. Uh, they don't have incredibly amazing farmland. Um, what they do have uh, is a good position in, in between several different major empires. They are, uh, they have important real estate not because it's so productive, uh, not because like it, Egypt grows way more food and Mesopotamia grow way more food than Israel ever could. Uh, Mesopotamia has rivers that are giant rivers that are always flowing and that flood regularly and that have these canals that come off of them. They can just grow crazy amounts of grain. Egypt has the Nile, which floods regularly every year and just brings tons of water and just produces tons and tons of grain. In Israel, they're waiting for the rains every year, and they hope they come, and uh, they have six months of no rain at all, and it, it is, people have to scratch a living from the soil. Uh, the, but the reason that Israel ends up being important is because it's the crossroads between Egypt and Mesopotamia. So the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians are always fighting over this piece of land. It's important for trade routes. It's important because it gives access to the coast. It gives access to the Arabian Desert where there's really cool stuff like spices that people want to get a hold of and different peoples like the Nabataeans um, who are trading out of the desert and trading these amazing spices and things like that. So uh, Israel ends up being um, important and fought over and dominated for most of its existence. Uh, so we think of ancient Israel as like, oh yeah, David was a real strong king. Um, there's a very short amount of time where Israel ends up being really truly independent and most of their existence, they're being beaten up either by Egypt or by uh, Assyria, part of Mesopotamia, or Babylon. Uh, and then later on, they're getting beaten up by Persia, which is uh, beyond Mesopotamia. You can see it there. Uh, and then even later, they're getting beaten up by the Greeks and then the Romans. Uh, so uh, Israel is, in many ways, um, uh, uh, being constantly dominated by these foreign powers. And so for the Old Testament, most of it takes place under either Assyrian domination, Babylonian domination, or Persian domination. And before that, you could say Egypt. Um, but Egypt actually, um, uh, pretty soon after the Exodus, uh, Egypt really loses its uh, cultural and military power for quite some time um, and uh, uh, is much less of a threat uh, to Israel uh, un until later on. Uh, but, it, but all to say that, these, the, that Mesopotamia um, ends up becoming the kind of center of power uh, during much of what we call the ancient biblical period. Okay, I know that was a lot of information. Um, so I, I hope it's not too much, uh, but feel free to comment, ask questions, uh, and I'll try to respond as best I can. Uh, and we can start a dialogue uh, between each other about what we think the, the text means and how it works. Um, I will look forward to jumping into Genesis next with you all. Uh, and then after that, we'll cover Exodus through Deuteronomy, and then we'll move into the prophets, and then we'll move into the writings. We'll talk about Psalms and wisdom literature. I'm really excited to jump into all this with you all. Thanks for sticking with me, and peace.